Hello mate, thanks for clicking on this video and welcome back to every Xbox Game Pass game ranked episode 2. It's been a long time coming, I know episode 1 was I think over 3 months ago, so it's been a bit of a wait but it's going to be worth it. There are a lot of good horror games on Xbox Game Pass. Now I'm talking about actual horror games, there are even more spoopy games on Xbox Game Pass, like 90% of the games in Xbox's own recommendation list. But, I mean, are Oxen Free and Mother Russia Bleeds really scary? I'm more afraid of my current string of life choices than I'm afraid of Thumper. That leaves us with far less games than in episode one, so the format is gonna be slightly different, but if you have time, I'd recommend going and checking out that first episode, if only because it took me a long time to make. I put individual box arts to each game, I ran timers, I ticked boxes, and people were still in the comments like, Ark in last place? Bruh. Hey, WTF, Ark is an amazing game. Who's watching in 2020? Video was published in July 2020. And where the hell is part two? Here the hell is part two. To be real though, my comment section is actually super positive, and I just wanted to say thank you for all those who show that support. Um, I read all of the comments and they genuinely do make my day. You guys are awesome. Um, but anyway, let's get on with the video. Oh, and don't don't worry about that guy in the corner. Um, he's new. Um, he's a little he's a little different, but uh, he's a nice guy. Um, so you know he'll be sticking around for a while. That was the scary part of my intro ticked off. That's the best I could come up with. All right, let's go on with the video. We're starting with this little game called World of Horror because it's the loosest form of a horror game. And that's not because it's in game preview, but because you haven't played a horror game like this unless you were playing Japanese text-based horror games in the 80s. And I doubt you were. Were you even alive? I wasn't. I wasn't even a twinkle in my dad's eye yet. I was more a star going supernova that would create the twinkle seen by my dad's eye from Earth 14 light years later. <laughs> and for all those unborn or unfamiliar with 80s Japanese horror games, World of Horror lets us know that things might be overwhelming. That's an understatement. You're a detective with the simple task of preventing doomsday, uncovering five mysteries and some awesomely gruesome illustrations. Depending on how you choose to investigate each location, you may or may not encounter ghosts, demons, and monsters, as is the case for text-based choose-your-own-adventure games. But also, nothing seemed to happen unless I explored the correctly labeled space, so it's hard to tell whether I had any real impact on the story. Still, it has a cool and customizable art design that mimics whatever this console is. Um, if you do know what that console is, I'm sure I seem like that kid in the Apple TV advert that was like, what, what's, a what's a computer? But uh, like I said, I wasn't alive. In my fourth ever YouTube video, also about horror games on Game Pass, I said repetition was the bane of a horror game's existence. And when I said it, my voice was much lower because I took myself far more seriously. And um, now I do stuff like this. Come on! No! Of energy. No! Oh, it's gonna be close. Just... <laughs> yes! <laughs> Is it to the base? Come on, Jeffrey! <laughs> base door. Yes! Man, where did it all go wrong? Anyway, Hello Neighbor best exemplifies this repetition. You spot your neighbor locking someone in the basement and you go to investigate, sneaking through this maze-like house to get the key while avoiding your neighbor. Get caught and you start again. As you go deeper into the house, things get a lot weirder and it turns into more of a puzzle game than anything. If you can stick with these increasingly abstract puzzles, there's also a deeper story than it first seems, but as a horror game, the hide and seek mechanic is a big letdown and I don't know, something about the game itself just puts me off. Uh, I don't know if it's the aesthetic, the rough mechanics, the level design, maybe it's all three, but yeah, I'm just not personally a very big fan. I'll give more credit to Secret Neighbor, a multiplayer variant where six kids work together to find keys while one is the neighbor in disguise. It's a much more involved and enjoyable iteration. You only have to look at Among Us to see how successful this format can be. I still think it lacks longevity though. There's little consequence that stems from being spotted as the neighbor, except that the kid must remember your gamer tag and keep a distance. You can try and explain what you saw over comms, but good luck. Uh, Secret Neighbor is console only, and while I found games in an instant, it's rare that people are on mic. Secret Neighbor is probably best played with five other friends in a custom game then, 
but even solo, I'd recommend it over Hello Neighbor. Man of Medan is the first story in the Dark Pictures Anthology, made by the team behind Until Dawn. Set on the real-life warship the Orang Medan, Man of Medan's intro gives its own version of what happened to the ship's crew who mysteriously died on board sometime in the 1940s. No spoilers, but it involves a lot of people dying with their mouths open, with that face that's like <laughs> And then there's this absolutely cracking intro song. Until Dawn's essence is draped all over Man of Medan, from the art direction to object interaction to the choice-based narrative. You're more involved in the choices this time round, deciding basically every word your controlled character says. The problem is, what you say doesn't really matter. I'm all for branching narratives that ultimately come back to the same root, but I noted two key points where my decision was just completely ignored. Hey, seriously, what's going on? How should we handle this? Uh, we are not doing anything. I'm the captain, so you be quiet and let me handle it. Few moments later. Take care of this man, it's not a problem. What do you think? Like, uh, 10 bucks cover it? Oh, whoops, my bad. Let's make it 20. Well, shoot, you, you think it's more like 30? I can do 30. Other people refusing to listen to you is fine. That's real life. But it's tied into Man of Medan's main problem, which is that the characters feel thrown together. You've got three key relationships. There are two brothers, one of the brothers and his girlfriend, and the girlfriend and her brother. The rest of them don't know each other. In fact, this is the first time they meet. There's minimal time for them to get to know each other because the story is rushed towards getting to the ghost ship. This isn't like Until Dawn, where there's a good four to five hours before shit goes sideways. Man of Medan's runtime is only four hours, and 75% of that are interactions that literally last a maximum of like four lines. A lack of character information and interpersonal relationships clouds everyone's motives, so I never knew if I was making the right choice and most of the time, I didn't care. That dilutes any impact the meta-narrative chats with the curator are supposed to have. Again, in Until Dawn, it's clear this guy knows something you don't, which gives his talk of choice and consequence impetus without being forced down your throat. The curator is literally like, you're doing well so far, and only ever tells you that these characters have relationships rather than the game showing you that. In fairness, one of Man of Medan's special features is a history of horror anthologies, and it seems that a curator character that explicitly narrates the story is commonplace. I still prefer the ambiguous approach of Until Dawn, but maybe the intro just threw me off that hard. Like. <laughs> Ah, what the hell, man. <laughs> man of Medan is the first in this horror anthology, a collection of short interactive stories, with the next one releasing on the 30th of October. I'll keep a little hope for things to improve. <laughs> Joke isn't that funny, I don't want I can't say it without laughing. Um, but it does have Will Poulter in it, so I have at least more hope for the voice acting. Ah, fuck off. Blair Witch The Game isn't a direct rip of the film, but the story follows as closely as you would expect. As close as you would hope, too. This game is the best tension builder so far, and I credit that mostly to the first person perspective and the source material. So, if you like first person horror games, and you like Blair Witch, I'd recommend this game. But given how specific that demographic is, I imagine those people have already played it. I'm not saying that game devs don't deserve any credit of their own. The setting is very good, the infamous video camera is cleverly used, and the climactic walk through the house is terrifying. But any gameplay elements aside from running or walking are a bit of a letdown, and frankly there are better first person horror games on Game Pass. Fractured Minds doesn't tell of monsters or ghost stories, but of fear and pain that is invisible to a lot of people. Made by Emily Mitchell when she was 17, each level of Fractured Minds represents a feeling. Paranoia, emptiness, anxiety, each expressed in highly stylized form. Emily herself suffers from severe anxiety, but these are feelings that thousands of people suffer from. And this game is dedicated to each and every one of you, containing a profoundly resonant message about living with the monster inside you. I'm fortunate enough not to experience any of these feelings to any extreme degree, but playing Fractured Minds 
was a deeply empathetic experience. And honestly, I just love the fact that this game is on Game Pass. Um, and I urge every one of you to play it. Emily Mitchell, you are an inspiration. Light is a key guiding force in linear games with wide landscape settings. Alan Wake makes light your safety net. This is more of a thriller than a horror, but that suits me fine because rather than the occasional scary face, I get a twisting story with grounded characters, much like a good Alan Wake novel. Darkness swells in anger as you move between beams of light. Shadowy figures emerge from your peripheries and you must shine your torch to defend yourself before moving to attack. Collectible manuscript pages uncover Alan's latest novel that he can't remember writing, but to say any more would be spoiling it. I was also surprised how good this looks on PC, considering Alan Wake came out on the 360 back in 2010. I can't say if it holds up just as well on console, but the clever way light illuminates the overall gloomy aesthetic means that you're only focused on the things Remedy Entertainment wants you to see. Senua's Sacrifice is the quintessential psychological horror because it's literally about psychosis. You travel to the depths of hell to bring your dead lover's soul back to the land of the living, but the real descent goes on in Senua's mind. Her journey a coping mechanism for her loss, and a vehicle for Ninja Theory to experiment with some clever visual and audio mechanics. I said this in my review of Senua's Sacrifice, which is my fifth ever YouTube video, and my voice is much lower because I take myself really seriously, and now I do stuff like this. <laughs> seriously, what happened? How do, what do I do? Anyway, I still quite like that video, even though it is very raw. Um, but go check that out if you want to know more about Senua's Sacrifice. Honestly, the game is really, really good, and I'm buzzing for the sequel next year. Dead by Daylight is a multiplayer slasher film where four survivors fix generators to open the exit while a killer hunts for their blood. Just like in a real horror film, survivors are prone to making quite stupid mistakes that attract unnecessary attention to themselves. <laughs> we are doing well. <laughs> Dude, chill. Ah! <laughs> at the beginning, it seems like all the advantage is with the killer, but the devs at behavior give the survivors a key edge perspective. Locking the killer to first person and the survivors to third person gives the latter a much freer range of visibility. That said, it's still very difficult to fix all five generators before you get caught. The best chance for survival is probably finding the hatch as the sole survivor, but you can still rely on your friend's help from the grave. I didn't need to fix that generator to be fair, like, I was not gonna... Yeah, it gave you away. Yeah. There's yeah. the hatch. There's the hatch as well, look. Oh my god, you're right. <laughs> look, oh, that's what you could have worked. Hatch. Wait, Toad, right go back to the hatch? I didn't see it. Oh, there. Oh, Wait, yeah. oh yeah, yeah, you're right. Shit. Ah, that was my bad plan. Run to the hatch! Run to the hatch! You have to it! <laughs> this is undoubtedly the most fun horror game on Game Pass, especially compared to what's left, where I genuinely had to fight the urge to quit. Thank you. Now prepare oh, to die. Sorry. Dead by Daylight's decision to lock the killer to a first person camera is obvious, but in that scenario, you're the one inflicting the horror. Resident Evil locks you to a first person perspective to scare the ever living sh out of you. I can't believe I'm going to say it, but I'm going to go back towards Marguerite. And the bugs! Oh God! That was a huge mistake. Resi 7 blends linear scripted events with open hide and seek segments in a perfect cocktail that has quite the kick. The opening hours are a kick in the balls, to be honest. Exploring the house and meeting Mia and Jack. <laughs> Fucking Jack, man. F his multiple hour unrelenting pursuit of you fooling you into thinking he's gone just to come back even more messed up than before. The mixture of confusion and tension and terror gradually faded for me after this point though, which in all honesty is kind of fine. Of all the games on here, Resi 7 is the only one where I was genuinely tempted to just stop playing, like straight up. And that's a mark of how good a horror game it is. Because I love playing it, I loved almost everything about it, but f dude, when I've been wandering around the house for 15 minutes while it creaks, and I have to prepare myself before opening every door, I really think about just stopping altogether. But I'm glad I didn't. 
like I said, it's when Resi 7 shifts from linear progression to a sandbox-like hide-and-seek is when it's at its best, but that only happens in the first half of the game. It's still a very good game after that, but I felt like I was longing for the thrill of those first few hours. Alien Isolation is the best example of Hunter vs Prey that I've come across. I said this when I reviewed Alien Isolation back in my fourth ever YouTube video, and my voice is all low, and because I took myself so seriously, and now I do stuff like this. Seriously, what, do, what is the point? But in all honesty, I don't think I gave this game enough credit back then. The alien really is the apex predator. It is so tuned to your movements that a single foot wrong results in death. It's tiny things like still being visible in a locker if you're too close to the vent or the alien hearing the faint beep of your motion tracker that you need to use to know where it is, but every time you do, you bring it closer. Little things that every other cat and mouse game I can think of would overlook. The game is self-aware in moments when you're close to being caught and that's when it ratchets up the tension another notch. Isolation wasn't the first game to introduce the hide and seek formula that is now favoured by most first person horror games, but it is the most complex. The Xenomorph is a walking puzzle you need to solve through smart positioning, quiet movements and timely distractions while the constant pressure of being hunted bears down on you. That makes isolation much harder than Resi 7 or Hello Neighbor. It is hard not to rush through areas you're repeating for the eighth time, but you must because sprinting any length of time is only going to bring trouble toward you. But for every eye roll, every minute spent hiding in vents that I lose, there are moments of real helplessness real vulnerability and true horror-induced fascination. It's completely gripping from the first encounter where I spent minutes cowering under a desk to the last where you exploit the Xenomorph's own tendencies to defeat it. It sounds super cliche, but this game really puts me in an alien film. It's returned a now aged horror film, if only from a pure scare factor perspective, into the present. And by that, I mean it's made the alien scary as hell. Get in there, please. Get in there. Oh my God. That's why this is my favorite horror game on Game Pass. And I think my favorite horror game ever. I don't know, Until Dawn is pretty <gasps> good. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for watching guys. I um, hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I think it's interesting to see Game Pass's evolution um, for horror games and just games in general between this video and that last video I published over a year ago. And it's kind of just nice to see because it kind of validates the reason I made this channel, which was initially for Xbox Game Pass and then I expanded to all video game subscriptions because I think that is the future in some form or description. That being said, it might be time for me to go back a little bit, take a step back. And I say that only because PlayStation now doesn't look set to, um, you know, move forward the same at the same rate as Xbox Game Pass. I'm going to wait a little bit because there is a chance that PlayStation now um, or so something from Sony uh, blossoms with the PS5. Um, but at the moment, all signs point to Xbox taking their video game subscription service uh, much further in terms of focus than PlayStation, which is totally fine. And I've said in many videos, I understand Sony's positioning uh, versus Microsoft's, and I understand why each company is doing what they're doing. But the premise of this channel is uh, video game subscription wars, and um, there is a chance that there isn't much of a fight to be had. And also one of the reasons is I just want to maybe branch out from my niche a little bit now that I have some kind of following. Um, so hopefully you guys would be cool with that. To be honest, when I if I do, you won't see that much difference. I'm still going to make um, video game subscriptions to focus because that's what you guys are here for. Um, and that's what I'm interested in still. Um, but just a heads up, I don't really know why I'm telling you this. There's not much point at the moment, but um, just something to bookend the video with, I suppose. As well as the normal, thank you so much for watching. Thank you for all the support. And please drop a like if you like this video and subscribe if you are new to the channel. That would mean the world to me. Happy Halloween. Goodbye.
For those of you wondering where Five Nights at Freddy's is in this list, it got released to Game Pass literally the same day I finished editing this video. And, you know, I'm, I'm a very busy man, um, so I don't have time to go and uh, shoehorn that into this list. So you're getting this instead. But I will um, play it at some point and it'll probably feature in the best jump scares on Xbox Game Pass. That video, which is coming very soon, potentially coming right now, if you get a little icon popping up in the right hand side of the screen right now. But like I said, I'm very busy and you probably are too. You should be getting off YouTube, to be honest. Get, get back to work. Go plant some trees or something. Happy Halloween. Thank you.